I thought we were the protectors of truth. Democrats, Republicans, you all lie. We, a small band of survivors, are on our way to the Steel City to find the resistance. Join us. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance with Senior Airman Ward Miller and the ironclad voice of Pittsburgh Hutch Jr. laying down verbal C4 to blow away the lies and the political tomfoolery. Your papers have been cleared. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Steel City Resistance. My name is Hutch Jr., and I am located deep, deep down inside the bunker in the city of Pittsburgh. Thank you, Byer Brown, once again. And I'm Ward Miller, also in the city of Pittsburgh, and you got that right. Byers hooked us up, and we really appreciate uh, all the stuff that he's done for us. And if you get a chance, uh, you can check him out at BB, what is BBTAS, uh, dot com. Get, check it out. Um, yeah, he's been he, getting into some different things. I think he was brewing for a while. He probably still is. Yeah, uh, he, he's doing a little bit of everything. Uh, so, yeah, give him, you know, check him out. Give him a shout out. Let him know that you, you, you heard about him from us. Yeah, he's a he's a promo master. That's for sure. I, I like that <laughs> every time I hear it. It's uh, like, wow, we got lucky on that one. Uh, Let's start out. This is going to be no different than any other week, ladies and gentlemen. It just keeps getting deeper and deeper. And uh, to me, I think that this uh, this show keeps getting more important. And I'll explain that uh, as we go here. Uh, but starting off the starting off the show, Ward, uh, a guy came on and we talked about him last week, uh, Doctor Ben Carson, just a phenomenal individual, the head of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins University and uh, hospital. And uh, this guy, I mean, I watched him last night. I actually watched him today uh, on a recording of Hannity last night. And I got to tell you, this guy, uh, he's an existential threat to the leftist movement. This guy right here, I watched him. I don't know if you, you people are familiar with uh, Luntz, I think his name is. He does the polls where everybody holds the dials and they dial their enthusiasm for someone when they're speaking, and uh, it, it could be skewed, uh, but he said that he was in Los Angeles and half the room was was uh, swing Democrats and the other half of the room was swing Republicans, and when he started talking about the debt, 100% of that room skyrocketed that dial. I mean, you could see the green line and the red line like right together going up, and I just feel that this guy has a way of communicating and a way of not sounding like a jerk that, uh, I mean, his, his bona fides are unquestionable, and I just hope that the guy has good security. Well, I think the part of it is, you know, I, I really like, you know, what Ben Carson says. So let, let me get that up front. Um, the, the only thing that I'm, I'm afraid of is because the Republican Party or the conservatives are so hard up for anybody who says anything vaguely conservative or vaguely uh, Republican leaning uh, on a national stage, that they gravitate to them. Um, I mean, and that happened with Sarah Palin. That happens with, you know, Ted Nugent. Uh, these people come on and they, and they start talking about principles that I agree with. I agree with 100 percent. But. I can't help but wonder if it's just because there's no other, you know, they're basically in an echo chamber because there's nobody else around saying that, saying what he's saying. And, and like I said, don't get me wrong. I agree with what he says. Uh, I just have to, you know, I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying for sure. Yeah, I, do. I, I hope that, that he, the really trendy does. type of thing that, you know, you don't want to just go with a trend. Sure. I, I, I like would I like him to run. Absolutely. I don't I don't know if he should run or not yet. I mean, that's going to have to be his decision. I think the thing that stood out to me the most is I cannot envision another Republican, period, standing next to the president like that and in a calm voice without, you know, demeaning him or anything, having the audacity to tell the truth like that in front of him. I mean, that. To me, that was the thing that got me. 
Well, what was good about it was the fact that he didn't launch an attack, which exactly. was smart. Exactly. He, he, he didn't go after and say, Obamacare stinks, and this is why it stinks. Right. I mean, I mean, being a doctor, he could do that. He could tear it apart. He, he knows all the ins and outs and all the problems with it, but he didn't. He mentioned it, and it moved on, and he never actually confronted the president or attacked the president in any way, shape, or form. If you, yet, uh, I don't he, know if you got he, to see he it last night. Steered the night. conversation his way. I don't know if you got to see it last night or if you just saw the, the the prayer breakfast. But, ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to anybody. It's out on YouTube. It's on the right scoop. You can watch the entire hour. Uh, with, it was all with him, with Hannity, and they had a in studio audience, and they had Luntz's group out there. Jeff Lords was on the panel. He's one of my favorite authors when it comes to politics. But uh, this guy went much deeper, and the the depth his, his mission his self-proclaimed mission was to fix this we have to educate the populace yeah and, i mean and that's but that that even from the prayer breakfast was his goal he he didn't he didn't say well we're gonna you know come up with this ideology and this is why the republicans are right or this is why the democrats are right or etc he basically said look you know we're doctors and we 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 look at the facts. Yeah. And the fact is we have too much debt. That's a fact. Nobody can dispute that fact. Nobody can say, no, oh, we don't have, you know, we're fine as far as debt goes. No, we're not. And everybody knows it. Even the hardcore Democrats, uh, you know, some may not acknowledge it, but they know that, the, the, you know, our climbing debt is a huge problem. Absolutely. And, I mean, there's other, there's a lot of things that contribute to that. And one of them is all of the things that we do in the United States that don't make any damn sense. And he touched on that also. Uh, he used the, uh, the the situation of insurance companies and doctors and patients. And patients, when you go to the doctor, you don't have a clue what you're getting costs. Uh, the MRIs and the, all the different tests. And the doctor is giving all kinds of unnecessary tests because he's afraid of malpractice lawsuits. And a person asked him about that, and, and he said, well, what we have to do, there's a fourth rail in government, and it's called special interest. The Trial Lawyers Association is why this is so skewed. And until we fix that, uh, it's not going it, to, the costs are going to continue to soar. The, the tests are going to continue to be prescribed. And doctors are going to go out of business. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, and and you can see this if you go to the doctor tomorrow, right? And you say, "Hey, doc, I, I wrenched the hell out of my knee. I can't. I can barely walk on it." And they're going to say, "Okay, take Motrin." Knowing that if they gave you, say, Vicodin or whatever, you'd be fine in a couple of days, mm -hmm. all right? But they tell you take the Motrin, and if that doesn't work, come back, and then they give you this, and they give you that, and it, you know, and it's, you know. Basically, they could fix it right away, but then if they prescribe to you, say, Vicodin or whatever, and then you take it and you get addicted to it, and then you turn around and sue the doctor because you got addicted to a, a prescription that they prescribed to you for for pain or whatever, and then it then it's on them. Yeah, it's, it's disgusting. And, and it's ridiculous. I'll give you another and, and example. And there's so many people out there just lined up waiting to sue these poor guys. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I can't stand it. When I see these commercials on television with these blood-sucking lawyers oh, yeah. uh, and understanding the damage that they're doing, uh, regardless if we get money for you. Uh, no, here's the thing. They only take the cases they think they can. Oh, win. sure. You know, Absolutely. you go in, yeah, it's a free consultation. You go in and they go, yeah, there's no way we can win that. So, yeah, we're not going to take the yeah, case. Yeah, certainly. And the, way, but, the, the thing is, another example is happened to me. I mean, I went and had some blood, some routine blood work done, and my red blood count was up a little bit. And the doctor damn near told me, you know, I had to go to a special whatever blood doctor is. I forget what they call him. But uh, I went there, and, and he basically told me, I'm going to give you five tests, and four of them I know are going to come back negative, but i got to give them to you anyway. And I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, it's like it wasn't a big guy, but it was like $25,000 worth of tests that he took so I wouldn't sue him because he didn't take them. You know, yeah. and it's just, like, ridiculous, man. I mean, it's... Uh, it's horrible. Anyway, this guy, I think he has a future, if not in elected office, then uh, just being as on the an scene. an advisor or something. Yeah, yeah, just being on the scene. I mean, maybe he'd make a good uh, Surgeon General, 
you know, or or, ma- or or maybe he could end up being. I mean, there's nothing. The whole idea that you have to have a pedigree to be in national office is bull. I mean, that's not the way the government's designed. There's no Obama doesn't have no pedigree, right? What but the, the, the ones that do have the pedigree are the ones that are screwing us up. They're the ones that have dedicated their entire life to this kingdom they have up there, and uh, they're the ones I feel that we need to get rid of. Uh, I'll tell you anyway. Like I said, I, this guy is a threat. He is a he's a black man. He's articulate. He came from the slums of Detroit, from a single mother, and turned it around. And that is and it's just, one of them cases where you you don't really have a, a shot at you know how do you call racism on that? Right. And he all he said he said I know they're checking on me. I know they're they're getting the skeletons in the cross uh, in the closet. He said, good luck on that. I lived a clean life. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, this guy's too good to be true, man. Give him a bulletproof vest, something. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, moving right along, uh, this situation, and you could probably address this better than I can, but uh, I guess Facebook made over a billion dollars last year, and they must have some damn good accountants because they're getting a refund this year. There's stuff been floating back and forth that that I've seen, and, and that's the the pro, one of the problems that I have. I can't can't verify it. You know what I mean? I I hate to to say yeah they, but apparently from from the stuff that I've read is there was a, some kind of a handshake deal made between Obama and Mark Zuckerberg, and you know uh, with all the the problems that that Facebook had with their IPO. You know when they when they went live and and whatnot and you know all the you know the fact that it tanked and they you know then they make a billion dollars and then they get money back from taxes. How the hell is that possible? Well, I, I'll I, I try. Have no idea. I'll try a little bit because I heard a financial guy talking about it, and I'm Give it a shot. I'm kind of halfway illiterate on this. So if I mess this up and there's somebody. In the audience, in the vast Steel City Resistance audience that wants to correct me, feel free. But the way I understand it is they gave out bonuses to their executives. And with all the, the bonuses, they, there's so much money that they made and has to be given or, or could be given out in bonuses, but they can only give so much out per year. So what they did was they gave these executives these really nice bonuses, and that's considered... Uh, like expenditures or whatever. It, it, it's something that th- I think the relationship with the president and Zuckerberg is what gave everybody the bad taste in their mouth. But the way this guy explained it is it's these loopholes in the tax code that allowed allowed a smart accountant to figure this out to where they could give this money away and then the corporation wouldn't have to pay income tax. Well, yeah, there's, there's tons of loopholes. And that's one of the things that, that Ben Carson brought out in, yeah, exactly. Yeah, during the prayer breakfast, that that made everybody go, "Hey, wait a second, he might have, he might be onto something here." Yeah, you know where he's basically talking about, you know, he says, you know, I, I got the tax code from the Bible. Right. And the Bible right. says you give ten percent. So if you make a million dollars, you know, you give a hundred thousand. And if it's ten percent or some other percent, as long as it's the same for everybody and it's proportional. The progress, I agree. The progressive tax code pits Americans against Americans, and when you take the lowest half of the income scale out of the tax program, now all you have to do is convince, or or you don't even have to convince them. If you if you make it up to like the rich, like they're trying to do now, they make up such a small percentage of the population slash electorate. It doesn't matter, you know. And that's where we are today, and and that's why that the the Democrats, the left, will never agree to a flat tax. Well, here's the thing. Once they once they keep pushing and pushing, you know, uh, this just happened in uh, was it? It was either Greece or France. I can't I can't remember right now. But France. what they did was they passed. It might have been France. Mm-hmm. They they passed a tax on the richest of the rich. You know, the 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 one percenters or whatever you want to call them. Au revoir. And, <laughs> yeah, and what they did is they basically they taxed them seventy five percent. Yeah. Seventy-five percent, and then they're they're like, well, "Why the hell are all these people? Why is there an exodus?" Yeah, and, and that's exactly why. You know, it, people don't mind paying exactly their share, especially you know? when they look around and they see everybody else paying their fair share. Exactly, you know. But the 
the the thinking of well you know you you're you don't make enough money hey i still you still spend money i don't care whether it's you're spending money that that you earned or you're spending money on an access card everybody should be charged the same there should be a consumption tax that's a flat tax period if you make a thousand dollars you give a hundred in you're square and you can have it taken out through deductions the same way the taxes are done now. And I think and, if you did that, I think you would eliminate the need for a lot of consumption taxes and, and sales taxes and things like that. I think that the, absolutely because you'd have you you'd quadruple your tax base. We'd sit in a, we'd settle in on a, on a percentage that was acceptable to everybody, and then it would be hard as hell to raise it. And that's the reason they don't want to do it. I mean, because now you've got people that are making ten thousand dollars a year part of the conversation too. And now they're starting to pay attention, and maybe they're going to get more active politically and everything else. You know, it's a big scam. I mean, it was called the progressive income tax for a reason. It's progressive as hell, and it's uh, conjuring up class warfare from coast to coast. I mean, it's horrible. Anyway, so we'll see what happens with Facebook. But I'm not necessarily saying they're criminal over it. It's just... Uh, it shows it's just that, kind of, yeah. It shows you favoritism, the, it, cronyism. It shows you the tax code's broken and it needs to be repaired. Uh, so they selected a new Secretary of State, and apparently this man, John Kerry, John Effingham Kerry, is not uh, getting any love from the foreign minister of Russia. I guess he's not like returning his calls, or I can't. Yeah. I can't see John Kerry as a, as a. He's just like a phony guy to me. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Yeah, he, he, he doesn't impress me as somebody who can be forceful. Um, even, you know, Hillary, when Hillary was there, Hillary could at least uh, oh, she's, attempt to, She's to scary be, guy now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she could be forceful. And Condi Rice was the same way. She could be forceful. Um, John Kerry doesn't, you know, he, he reminds me of Lurch. Anybody that calls Genghis Khan Genghis Khan just, like, lost it right out of the box. I mean, Yeah, and, and well, and the fact, you know, I mean, he's Lurch, for crying out loud. Yeah, he is. He you does know, have a long head. Like, you right. <laughs> and he has that accent, too. I mean, that, he has the accent, and he's kept by a woman. Nothing against you women out there. But that just, uh, just I don't know, man, because it used to be our senator, his wife, you know, his wife's husband, John Hines. And uh, yeah. Heinz is catching hell too, but I'm not going to go there. We got too much other, other stuff to to deal with. Now I just found this out last week, Ward. I must have been sleeping under a rock, but I was always under the impression that this sequester was going to be cuts. And I just found out last week from listening to Rand Paul that these are not cuts at all. These are not. These are the baseline budget uh, reduction in the increase in spending. Five hundred billion or a trillion almost we were going to raise our our, our expenditures by a trillion dollars well I, I can't i couldn't say one way or another because you know the the president hadn't put forth a budget nor has the senate approved or passed a budget so i don't know exactly where the hell they're getting the number in the first place uh you know it's like this think about this if it was you Right. And I'd say, OK, Hutch, we're going to be going on a trip. All right. Me and you, we're going to go on a trip to California and I need you to kick in ah, whatever you feel like. OK. And, and, you know, but it's going to cost the trip itself is going to cost us, uh, I don't know, a lot of money. You know, I, I don't have a number, but you got to save up uh, yeah. money so that we can go on this trip that we don't know what it's going to cost. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, that's though. basically what is going on in Washington right now. That's 100% they're, they're of the budget. They're running without like a that. budget. That's they right. haven't had a budget in four years. They're, and Harry Reid has absolutely no intention of even bringing a budget up. The president has to has to uh, submit a budget, and he's already missed the date on it. And when he submits it, he has yet to have a budget get passed. And I mean, even, at the end of the he day. He hasn't even gotten a vote on his budget because even people in his own freaking party say no. Yeah, I mean, you've heard him. You've already heard him start talking about there's not going to be any police and there's not going to be any military and there's not going to be any research. And at the end of the day, when the sequester is over and you look at the at the checkbook, not one red cent went down. This didn't go down from a zero budget perspective. This is a this is reduction in the growth of spending. Yeah, so, so at the after after cutting a trillion dollars, we spent. 
at least as much as we did last year. And to me, that is grotesque. And Rand Paul is the only one with the balls to say it. And I mean, why aren't the why isn't Boehner saying that? You know, why isn't McCain saying that? These these people that are in there that sometimes I wonder why I care that we're they're in there because they don't do what needs to be done. It, it drives me nuts, Ward. I mean, it's like why does this one guy that that's a firebrand or whatever have to be the only one that I've been listening about this sequester for for a year, however long, six months. And it's been portrayed to me as it was going to be cuts. And then I turn around and find out it's not true. There's no cuts. Yes, it's in, not increases. There's no cuts involved at all. That's no, a, but what it's going to do is it's going to impact the, the guys that that are, you know, like the military guys, you know, because they're not going to get a pay raise this year. All right. That's fine. You know, I mean, that kind I, of thing. I think most I mean, of us would say, all right, if that's what we got to do, then, you know. Yeah. But let's no, be serious and, and, about it. And, and and I'm not saying I mean that's that's what it really is, and that's not how they're portraying it. They're portraying it as it, we're going to gut the, the navy. There's going to oh, be yeah. you know two boats out there you know in the fleet, and you know we're going to we're going to decimate the Marine Corps. There's we're going to get rid of two hundred thousand Marines, and you know it's and, and and it's just all garbage. It is. Now uh, we we got an email and uh, we we spoke about. Ron Paul last week, and I'm I'm going to uh, honor the listener. Uh, Eric wanted us to to uh, talk about Ron Paul's response on his clarification, so I will give him that. After a public backlash, former presidential candidate Ron Paul used his Facebook page to clarify controversial comments he made Monday about the Navy SEAL who was killed at a Texas gun range over the weekend. On Monday, Paul 77 took cyber heat for a tweet he sent out following the news of the veteran's death. Paul wrote, Chris Kyle's death seems to confirm that he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Treating PTSD at a firing range doesn't make sense. His comments were retweeted more than 800 times, and most of the responses he received were negative. Paul backtracked some and offered a clarification on his Facebook page. He wrote, As a veteran, I certainly recognize that this weekend's violence and killing of Chris Kyle were a tragic and sad event. My condolences and prayers go out to Mr. Kyle's family, but then he has to go on. Unconstitutional and unnecessary wars have endless unintended consequences. A policy of nonviolence, as Christ preached, would have prevented this and similar tragedies, R.E.P. So, uh, all right, that, that's done. Uh, I got to say something about that. You know, I, I'm really tired of the, the left and everybody saying that these are unconstitutional wars. What... Obama did when we attacked Libya was an act of war that was unconstitutional. The Congress was not informed of it, or they were informed of it, but they didn't vote on it. You know, no matter how you look at it, no matter how you want to paint the picture, what happened in Afghanistan when we went to war in Afghanistan, Congress signed off on it. When we went to, to war in Iran, Congress signed off on it. Iraq. It, it, there, or, or Iraq, excuse me. It... it there was no unconstitutional anything. Well, I think and, once you and get... the fact that they keep saying this is unconstitutional, unconstitutional, that it's going to sink in and somebody's going to think, yeah, yeah, that was unconstitutional. No, it followed the letter of the law. Bush went to the to Congress and said, we want to go to war. This is what we're going to do. And they underlined it. Congress signed off on it, and we went. Yep. So, As a war so the powers fact that Ron Paul saying that it's unconstitutional means that he doesn't know what the hell the Constitution is. Uh, well, the thing is, once you have the, boots the on the ground. Are out there, my, my point, Hutch, is the guys that are out there are fighting for this country that are in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and put their lives on the line and ended up coming home with this PTS, PSTD or PS, post PTSD that come back with it, they're heroes. They, they followed the Constitution. They did their duty. And for people like Ron Paul to stand up and say the f that they were that it's an unconstitutional war, shame on you. Yep. Shame on you. You should learn what the fuck the Constitution means and what an unconstitutional war is. You should be bringing up charges against Obama for launching an attack into Libya without the approval of Congress instead of sitting on your fucking hands and badmouthing a, a, a war hero. Yeah, as soon as one, one boot is committed, I think that's the time where you, you don't take your political arguments out against them. 
Now, that being said, I would like to see the United States government get closer to the Constitution when it involves combat. I think that, that we should regroup and we should, and that has nothing to do with Chris Kyle, but I think that, that we really need to get back to either fighting a war or not. I think we should declare war and destroy, so if it gets to the level, and I'm not saying that Iraq was wrong or Afghanistan is wrong or anything like that, but here's the deal. When you have situations like Afghanistan and Iraq, you have a few people engaged. When you have a war, you have the whole entire military and country engaged, and you get it over with. You, you bring it violently, and you get it over with as soon as you possibly can. You break you, it out. You get out. You break everything. If, if it comes to the level where you're ready to start committing men and women their lives to this, then it better be worth taking down the capital of wherever you're going. And that's just me. I think that we've, after World War II, there was some precarious communism going on, and, and we needed to do some things. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, everything we touched, we broke. We went to Korea right after World War II, and North Korea has a nuclear weapon now. We went to Vietnam, and Vietnam's capital is Ho Chi Minh City. You know, I mean, I hate to say that, being, you know, a proud member, but, I mean, those efforts were only half efforts. And God, yeah. bl God bless all the people that died and were wounded, but, but I mean, I just think it's time to reset. They were sent to war, but they weren't, they, they weren't allowed to fight. Yeah, and there was all it, kind and, of restrictions. I mean, now at least we're allowed to fight, but, but it, it's still, you know, to be honest with you, you know how... You know how, how Afghanistan makes its money? Heroin. Heroin. Poppy. So what you do is you don't go in there and, and, and you know, we're trying to strategically get the drug lords and all this stupid bullshit. You go in there. <laughs> get some you, flame flower tracks in there. Exactly. You come in and you napalm the fucking ground. And then once that's finished burning, you salt the goddamn earth. Yeah. And it's I mean, a, but that's that's total something. that's total war though, and that's something that that's we don't do. That's how you do it. And I then agree. You don't have to worry about them coming back in five, ten, fifteen years because it's going to take them that long just till they can figure out how to grow shit and salt. And you and you declare war. You do it the way that the War Powers Act. But that's my hasn't that's served my us point. very well. <laughs> that's my point. Yeah, you know, for for Ron Paul to come out and say that. The war that, that Chris Kyle was involved in was unconstitutional is beyond the pale. That was for him to get headlines. I mean, that was that was just something that was should have never been done. It, I mean, but that's what it is. It's yeah. beyond the pale. He, if he wants to call out somebody, Obama's done all kinds of stuff. I mean, we were I launching agree. cruise missiles into Libya without <laughs> congressional authority. Here's the thing. And, You've and heard... nobody, and 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 to this day, Congress has not stood up and said that and, and called bullshit on that. I agree, and not a flag went to half staff for Chris Kyle. And let me explain what Chris Kyle is, ladies and gentlemen. Here's what Chris Kyle is. You've heard of the Red Baron? You've heard of Audie Murphy? Chris Kyle is this generation's Audie Murphy, ladies and gentlemen. He took out 150, at least, individual soldiers by himself. Nobody else did that before. He is our war hero, and you'll be hearing about Chris Kyle for the next 100 years. Mark my words. So anyway, it's... it's uh, a little bit of uh, relief to hear that. Somali Muslims are getting ugly in Minnesota lately. I don't know if you, you read about that. Uh, there was a, a brawl in the cafeteria. I guess Muslims make up the, 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 cap, the high school was South High School. I think it was in Minneapolis. But the population of the, of the students is 8% Somali Muslim, 20% black. And they went at it with each other. And, I mean, they had to bring in the mace and everything else. And I started looking into it. And I guess the Somali gang problem in Minnesota is getting bad. And that's the, that's the home of the worst congressman in the Congress, Keith Ellison. He's a uh, Muslim Brotherhood operative. Uh, so that, that's just something we're going to have to watch. Absolutely. These, these cities that are getting uh, influxed. Infiltrated. Yeah, it's disgusting. It really is. Now, i got to say something because I'm not a very big fan of Lindsey Graham. But I don't know about you, but Lindsey Graham's been kicking ass lately. Yeah, it it really impressed me. Uh, me too. When he went off on uh, 
on Hagel said, I will do everything in my power to block him because they, the, the White House refuses to answer from Benghazi. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, he surprised the shit out of me. And he even came out again and said, hey, I got an AR-15. You know, and I was like... <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I never... I, I'll be, I'll be the first one to say it. I was never a big fan of Lindsey Graham, either. but he's taken a stand on something that's worth taking a stand on mm -hmm. uh, more than more than a lot of people, uh, more than a lot of, of representatives have. Uh, Hagel didn't get uh, didn't get congressional approval because of it. Uh, he didn't get uh, confirmed because of it. And you know, the the thing that really gets me is. Uh, and in fact, Hutch had posted something on Twitter earlier that I that I saw and I resent it out was the fact that CNN is basically saying, why are they still worried about this Benghazi? Isn't that something? Isn't that just unbelievable? Even 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 with our polarized and leftist media, these people are anti-American. It's sickening. It's absolutely sickening. I mean, I can't help but think about that man being drug around and that hostile crowd full of Muslims getting his clothes torn off and who knows what else they did with him. You know, there, there hasn't been, we haven't heard anything about an autopsy. You know, did he get, did he get sodomized? Did they light him on fire? What'd they do? I mean, these people are, it drives well, me crazy. Here's the thing that gets me. Uh, there was that, that boat, you know, that, that carnival cruise ship. <laughs> that that these people just you know they had to live for five days without air conditioning and and you know they they were survivors and whatnot. And to their credit, but, most of them said, you know, stop it. We were on a cruise ship and it was a little tough. Some of the ones that were interviewed, you know, it's yeah, the, it's the media. Here's my point. They were interviewed. I agree. Where are the people that they that they drug out of, of Benghazi? Where are they? Where uh, where are those interviews? You're right, and they need to be brought forward. And this needs to be. And that's one of the things Graham's doing. And by God, we let go of Fast and Furious. We let that go. We can't let go of this one. This one here, it just can't be let go. There's no way it ought to be strung around Hillary Clinton's neck. Whoever runs for president the next time, if they don't freaking run it around her neck, then I'm not voting. You know what I mean? This is, this is, this is just to a level that is entirely too far over the line for anybody to be allowed to do it. It's just, it is. It, it's something I keep thinking of that poor bastard and those... Those blood streak finger marks on the on the wall, and it's just uh, it, it can't stand. It really can't. Yeah, I, I hope you're right. Well, it's going to be up to they, us. They, it's, yep. it's going to be up to us and people like us and people with some some uh, intestinal fortitude that I didn't think Lindsey Graham had that apparently he does for this for this subject matter anyway. So three cheers to you, Lindsey, and keep on fighting. And everybody else, Fox News. I mean. When this is all said and done, and it's time for people to go to prison, NBC, you're going with them. You know what I mean? You are going and with CNN, them. And uh, CNN, run down the list. I mean, you're absolutely it, right. Not, not any of them. They're treasonous bastards, and I had enough of it. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we did the show early on Saturday, so the your weekly jihad report was not posted yet. So and now, your monthly jihad report for the January 2013 time frame. 193 jihad attacks in 22 countries against five religions, 931 dead bodies, and 1,480 poor souls were critically injured in January of 2013. The religion of peace, ladies and gentlemen, one body at a time. So, another little piece of disgustingness. Have you noticed the trend that these politicians, these leftist politicians, are all trying to, like, rewrite facts, saying that we don't have a spending problem? Well, it, it, it's one of them cases where, uh, you know, where the story is Nancy Pelosi went out and, and said that it's a false argument to say that Washington has a spending problem. Really, Nancy? It, 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 I think it's one of those cases where they think that if they say the same thing over and over again with enough uh, conviction that some poor bastard's actually going to believe them. That is absolutely the topic. I mean, and that's what it is. It's like, you know, they basically, la, 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 Benghazi, what, blah, 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 Steny. there's no such thing, da, 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 da. There was other you ones, know? too. Steny Horrier was like, we don't have a, sp they get all goofed up, they don't know how to say things. We don't have a spending problem. We have a paying for it problem. What? 
Yeah, it's just <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> you know, there was but, another yeah, one too. It's not a problem that we have with spending. It's a problem we don't have no money coming in. Yeah, well, yeah what was the other guy too? He said we don't have a spro- pro- uh, spending problem. We have a budgetary balance problem or something. I'm thinking you guys are retarded. I mean, you, you're counting on the dumbness of the United States, and it, I think that's running out. I do. Well, speaking of dumbness, I got, I got to bring this up because it, it came out and we didn't bother, you know, and I'm skimming through the notes real quick there's, right now. There's only an hour. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have enough time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it in anyway. Uh, speaking of ridiculous, stupid crap that the, that the media does, uh, what happened to Marco Rubio, oh, he got yeah, a drink of yeah. water. Okay, I, I got to touch on this. Go ahead. I get thirsty. And anybody who watches the show knows I sit here and I drink Mountain Dew. So normally between the times when Hutch is talking – I'm taking a sip of Mountain Dew to keep my throat dry, keep my throat moist and my mouth moist so I can talk. Marco Rubio, the poor guy, was in front of a whole bunch of lights. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he was nervous. He's speaking to the entire country, something that he never has had to do before. He got thirsty. He took a drink of water. Wolf Blitzer made it like he, he executed a woman on. He, he beheaded a fucking woman on national television. MSNBC ran that water. ran that clip 155 times to Fox News is 12. I mean, because it, it's a non-story. And it I is got thirsty it, for Christ's sake. It's a tactic, though, Ward. You got You got to identify it for what it is. When when somebody from the right has a, a message that is resonating. You have to divert. You have to cause a diversion. It was totally on purpose. It was totally ridiculous. Marco Rubio needs to tighten up his skills on fighting with this leftist Obama media. Well, no, I thought what was really cool was right afterwards he... he... That, he started selling water bottles. He started selling <laughs> Rubio water bottles. Uh, okay, this next segment is... Uh, this is going to be a teachable moment right here. Uh, Ted Cruz has got some people nervous, Ward. He's got some Republican senators, and he's got all the Democrats. He's got Obama. He's got these people nervous because he's not playing by their rules. He is coming out there. Normally, when a freshman senator comes in, he doesn't say shit for a couple years. Yeah. They come in there, and they just go with the flow, and the old idiots teach them how to be idiots themselves, and, and they get introduced to all the people with the money and all the lobbyists and everything like that. Well, Ted Cruz is having none of that. He came in in the first few months, and he was firing on them so hard that the left, and this is the teachable part, this is the lead-in to the teachable part, uh, MSNBC ran a, a, a hit piece. Is this the new McCarthyism? Ted Cruz's innuendo war against Hegel. And after that, it was all over all of the different uh, news organizations, leftist news organizations, about him being like uh, being like McCarthy. Uh, and, and, and I mean, they did the same thing with Representative Pete King when he started talking about Islam. And uh, I just wanted to wanted to touch on the Cruz piece. Because I think Cruz is one of the top leaders of the Senate right now, bar none, bar absolutely zero. You can take all the John McCain's you want and send them to pasture and bring me some Ted Cruz's in. I mean, absolutely. Ted, Ted Cruz is, is one of the the uh, the mavericks, if you will, who's not afraid, who, who doesn't back down, who says what he believes, and you know, and and that it's so sad to say this but it's refreshing to yes, see you know somebody actually come up and say what they what they think not i'm going to pull toe the party line or i'm going to you know say this because i think you know i mean they, he's this guy's this like us want to hear he, yeah, exactly. he, he uses video clips in his te- in his testimony in the senate he had hey awesome. he had hegel up there saying the stuff he said he was saying he put it and they asked him not to the Republicans in the Senate asked him not to. I say you stay the hell away from Ted Cruz. You know, if if I if I find any senators by name now, McCain's already one of them. McCain got to go. I wish they could find somebody. Where's he from? What's his... who's that? Cruz? No, McCain. What state's he from? McCain's from. Um, they got a fi- uh, they got a primary. That guy, man. I I had so much. I'm sick of him. It's I, not Arkansas. It's... No, it's uh, I don't even remember. It doesn't matter. We'll figure it out. By the time those elections come around. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, now, the point of, part of the point of the last uh, segment was to illustrate how well the leftist communist apparatus works. 
when it Arizona. Re- yeah, that's it. Where when it rewrites history. Now, when you think of McCarthyism, first of all, I'm, we're going to do a little biography on on Mr. McCarthy here, Senator McCarthy, one of the greatest American heroes ever to be in Washington. McCarthy, let me just, and this is going to require a little bit of a little bit of reading, but if if you don't get anything else out of this show tonight. You're going to hear this this uh, accusation of McCarthyism quite frequently coming up, and I, I just want you to understand if you don't already, because our generation was taught wrong. That the left ha- had totally destroyed McCarthy by the time we were in school. So you have to do a little of your own research to realize that this man possibly saved the nation. But he was right. That's, 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 that's what I'm the saying. Thing that they never talk about it's. Oh, McCarthy went after people, and he arrested people who who was com who he, who he claimed was communist, and they were, and you know he persecuted them, and, you know persecuted and prosecuted because they were communists, and they were. Yeah, but let's let's um, let's listen to some of the facts because a lot of them have been blown. That there's been a lot of uh, uh, purposeful skewing of things. Senator Joe McCarthy is one of the strongest pro-American figures in the history of the United States. Despite many attempts by socialists to demonize McCarthy and McCarthyism with revisionist history, McCarthy's achievements shine through the propaganda. At a time when America was threatened by a murderous, backward, anti-freedom ideology of Soviet communism, Joseph McCarthy was a champion of capitalism and democracy. And by the way, he was liberal. He was Republican, but he was economically liberal. Even when his career was threatened because of his vocal anti-communist speeches, McCarthy did not back down from the cause of freedom. For the courage Senator McCarthy showed in sticking to his American principles, he is today considered to be a hero by many. Joseph McCarthy was born in 1908, after America was attacked on, he went in the military. Uh, In the late 1940s, Russian spies infiltrated the deepest levels of the U.S. government, including the Rosenbergs, who had stolen the plans to the nuclear bomb. America was threatened by a ruthless enemy in Soviet communism that would not stop until the world was enslaved. When Senator Joe McCarthy learned of the Russian infiltration of Washington, D.C., he was determined to take the evidence public to the American people. In his famous speech on February 9, 1950, McCarthy brought public a list of 57 known communists working for the State Department. These revelations, now think, think about Michelle Bachman when she brought the list of Muslims, uh, of Muslim Brotherhood types that were in the State Department and other departments. Think of how the the left and establishment on the right reacted. They vilified her. Absolutely. Uh, Out of all the senators and public figures in Washington, only McCarthy had the courage to stand up against communist infiltration. It was a deed that McCarthy's leftist critics would never forgive him for. For the next four years, McCarthy stood undeterred against the strong socialist influence in Washington, exposing literally hundreds of anti-American operatives working incognito for the U.S. government. The American people generally appreciated McCarthy's brave efforts, and he was well-liked all across America. McCarthy's enemies also followed his activities with a strong interest. Determined to stop McCarthy from spreading the truth about their communist agenda, many anti-American Hollywood, think about this, now relate this to current times, many anti-American Hollywood insiders found willing accomplices in the budding liberal media. These propaganda mongers added a new word to the dictionary, defining McCarthyism as a senseless political witch hunt. Witch hunt. In fact, McCarthy had exposed scores of known communists in the Capitol without a single known false accusation. Joseph McCarthy's critics were never interested in the truth, however. The the leftist counteroffensive against McCarthy was beginning to take its toll in late 1953. Many senators became fed up with McCarthy's showmanship as liberal media relentlessly launched baseless attacks against his character. On a dark day in American history in December 1954, American hero and patriot Joe McCarthy was censured by the U.S. Senate. Following his censure, McCarthy sunk into alcoholism from which he never recovered. He died of hepatitis on May 2, 1957 at the age of 49. Even after his death, McCarthy's critics continued to crucify him posthumously, not satisfied with merely ruining a man's career and driving him to alcoholic suicide. 
The liberal media courageously dragged McCarthy's name through the mud for the next 50 years, continuing to this day. Leftists have never forgiven McCarthy for his crime of exposing them for who they truly are and still are, inventing phrases like the Red Scare to demean McCarthy's anti-communist efforts. The Venona Project files declassified 1995 provided indisputable evidence that nearly all of those McCarthy accused were traitors to America. Not surprisingly, the media ignored these documents completely, instead choosing to run yet another round of anti-McCarthy propaganda as if that wasn't enough. In 2005, Hollywood released the greatest pop propaganda film since Triumph of the Will, an anti-McCarthy slander picture known as Good Night and Good Luck. Dead for 50 years, McCarthy's body has now been tarred, feathered, crucified, cremated, and his ashes shot into space by a leftist media who cannot handle the truth of their own miserable existence. The anti-McCarthy media claims the senator wrongly implicated many. Despite their accusations, no critic has ever brought forth a single documented case of someone being wrongly accused by McCarthy. Now, there, there's a little bit more here, but we're running late. I just had to do that, Ward. I mean, this guy has been so vilified, and it has been such a successful communist campaign with elements inside our own nation that kids believe McCarthy was wrong. Of course. Adults uh, do, too. Absolutely. And, and so does the, and the media still, you know, it's a McCarthy-type witch hunt and blah, blah, blah. But, it, but the thing was, he was right. He was. Um, we got to move on, but I... There was a story that came out yesterday that we didn't put in the show notes, and I'm going to throw you another curve hot so follow bring along. Bring it, bring it. Uh, and the reason we haven't, we didn't have this story was because, surprise, surprise, the mainstream media didn't report it. Uh, do you know who Harrison J. Brunel is? No. According to the 2009 tax return submitted by President Barack Obama, he's the president of the United States. Oh, that's right. The, the Supreme Court hearing was the other the day. The Supreme Court hearing was uh, Friday. That wasn't even on Fox. Nobody, nobody carried it. But the Supreme Court did hear the case, um, and the they went after a couple different things. They went after the uh, certified copy of the of the passport uh, records of uh, Obama's mother, Stanley Ann Dorm, showing her son's legal last name to be so Baraka, not Obama. Obama's school records from Indonesia showing his citizenship to be Indonesian. Damn. Sworn affidavits from top law enforcement experts and investigators showing Obama's birth certificate and selective service certificate are forgeries and that the uh, social security number used by Obama on his 2009 tax returns as posted on whitehouse.gov was fraudulent. The social security number failed when checked through both E-Verify and the Social Security Number Verification Service. Jeez, I mean... So, I mean, I don't know how much more stuff you need, but that's going on. Uh, there's the, they're supposed to have a judgment by Tuesday. So we should hear something, uh, you know... That's going to be something. Another. That's going to be something else, man. I mean, that's evidentiary in nature that if they rule, you know, most of the things that the Supreme Court deals with, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think, are like almost ideolog ideological and, and related to the Constitution. But yeah, th this, it's all Constitution-based. This here is like, is physical evidence-based, you know? Yeah, well, it's physical evidence-based that he defied the Constitution. But I mean, it's more black and white than just five guys, oh, yeah. 10 people or 11 or whatever, sitting in a, or nine, let me get my shit together it's here. It's not. Uh, you know, all, deciding whether or not though, all nine justices heard the testimony. But I mean, it's different when you have nine people of different ideologies deciding whether or not Obamacare is constitutional than whether or not this evidence in front of you is right or wrong. I mean, it's right there. You know, for the ages, people are going to be able to go back and judge and say, you lied. It's right there. It's not a real document. Exactly. You know, so it's going to be a little bit harder for them to be subjective about this, I think. Well, and I think they're keeping it quiet because, I mean, this could be huge. Uh, well, I don't see. I don't think I don't it's right how, for them to keep quiet. How Obama wins this case? I mean, I don't know. I've never looked. I've, I've I've seen testimony where a guy, a forensic pathologist, swears to God that this was not a piece of paper. 
you know i mean i don't know what happened or you know i'm not that skilled but if it's not a piece of paper then somebody's in trouble because you're saying and, it's well, a piece of paper and the fact is that the social security number he used on his taxes yeah, from was connecticut guy, it was from a dead guy in connecticut yeah, this is this is getting uh, this is when the chicago mob blows up on itself yeah. uh and it's like uh when we were listening to that, and we didn't report on it because it, we couldn't uh, verify any of it with uh, Lyndon LaRouche, but his every other sentence was, or he stages a coup d'etat. You know, that's the only thing. I mean, he's brought forth with all this. Does he give up power like an American would, or does he? It's going to be. I don't think he has much choice. Uh, well, uh, that's true. I mean, I don't think that he commands the respect that he thinks he does. Uh, with I, with the masses, I think that a lot of that was was trick screwed around with with voting irregularities and things like that. I mean, well, I think that if if he's in office and the Supreme Court finds that you know he beca he obtained that office fraudulently, he's done. I mean, and, and they I vacate agree. the office. I think so too. I mean, I think and, that any legislation that he signed from the beginning of his presidency. Is now null and void. And I mean, and I think if there's any hesitation, because you know how he's been with the Supreme Court. If you remember at the State of the Union, no one's ever done that before. Looked at the Supreme Court justices and told them they were all jacked up. That never happened before. No. And, you know, I think if uh, if you start seeing some balking or something like that, maybe a, a couple mechanized infantry battalions surround the Capitol, you know. I mean, I hate to say it, but I, I, this guy has done so many things, Ward, that, that have not even come close to occurring before, that you you got to sit there and think, what is he capable of? You know, I mean, yeah, $16 I mean, trillion. It, dollars. It, it's one of them cases where, okay, you know, if, if he gets found, if it's found that, that he got the office fraudulently and he gets, you know, ousted, does that mean that there's going to be race riots and whatnot? I Potentially. Doubt, I doubt it. But but the thing is, it's, it's, it's possible. But the thing that gets me is, it's what Vladimir Putin said. Now, now just consider, Vladimir Putin said, he's either stupid as hell, which we know he's not, or he's doing this to America on purpose. Now, imagine what it looks like if the dollar is worth a penny. Yeah. To, to, for you to willingly go down that road. For the vast majority of people out in the country that aren't protected the way you are and maybe aren't as prepared as some other people are, but a big chunk of people are going to be in deep shit if that happens. And well, for you to put that too. much pain on people makes me wonder what else you're willing to do. I want to find out if uh, Congress actually has gone through and said that they verify that he's the president. Because anybody who signs a document verifying him as president, meaning that he has the the all the you know he's passed all the tests required to be the president of the United States, if he failed on any of that, and and Boehner signed off on it, and his name's on a document saying that he verifies that he's a legitimate president of the United prison. States, prison, he goes to prison for perjury. Yeah, I mean, we, there has to be a rule of law here. We can't no, be a that, rule. I mean, of, that, that that is the law. I mean, if you uh, whatever it, it is, we I haven't mean, been following it up to now. We need to start. To show notes are totally shit kicked. Uh, <laughs> 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 the government debt hit sixteen trillion dollars, up two hundred and seventy fifty seven percent under Barack Hussein Obama. We do have to cover this story though. That one there is just all there. Yeah. Uh, but these guys in Fort Hood, I mean, they're getting screwed. They they, they are dead serious when they're calling this a place of, or a uh, incident of workplace violence. And ladies and gentlemen, what that means is that all these soldiers that were shot and still alive, uh, and even the soldiers that were shot and killed, uh, there's different, uh, I don't want to say benefits because that sounds like so stupid, but it is. They should all have Purple Hearts. They should all be in the Purple Heart Association. You know, they should all be recognized for the wounded warriors that they are. And they're, they're seen as victims of workplace violence right now. They didn't even get any any compensation? No, um, the the fact that that this White House calls the the attack in Fort Hood workplace violence is, is just beyond ridiculous. Because when you have somebody who opens fire on people that are unarmed, screaming "Alu Akbar," 
that's t that's a, an act of terrorism. I, you can't paint that any other way. And listen to this sickening an act of terrorism. Listen to this sickening justification. Army Secretary McHugh says awarding Purple Hearts could adversely affect the trial of Major Hassan. To award a Purple Heart, it has to be done by a foreign terrorist element, said McHugh. No, it doesn't. So to declare that soldier a foreign terrorist, we are told, I'm not an attorney and I don't run the Justice Department, but we're told would have a profound effect on the ability to conduct the trial. The hell with the trial. What about the soldiers? Well, the thing is that, that Hassan is making a mockery of the, of, the, of the military judicial system anyway because he grew a beard and said, I'm not going to shave it off. So uh, court-martial law says that you have to be clean-shaven to have the court-martial. So he, he just says, I'm growing a beard and I'm not shaving it off. It was, and so they keep postponing his trial because he won't shave. I mean, it was clearly it, an predictive. act of terrorism, and this whole this whole story is uh, just unbelievable, man. I mean, it's just uh, and that's not the reason they're doing it. They're saying that, and everybody's lining up to be good soldiers to protect the commander in chief. But let me tell you, man, this is this is all ideological, uh, and, and I can't believe we let this get so far down on the docket here. Uh, that I did that because I usually move these up. Obama made no phone calls on the night of the Benghazi attack. We heard that uh, in, in the last week. Uh, and that's just, uh, he, he talked to nobody. I mean, he uh -huh. I mean, the Secretary of Defense, we did talk about this last week. Yeah, we touched on it last week, but then there was more testimony that came out. Yeah. And, and they were really holding to the fact that, you know, Obama had his pre-scheduled meeting with Panetta half at 5 p.m. Half an hour. That's, yeah, what, that's what he spent. And, and he just said, handle it. Whatever comes up, handle it. Now, I don't know about you, you know, but it's my understanding that for us to infringe on any anybody's, any sovereign nation, whether we launch any kind of a military mission, in any kind of a sovereign nation, that is an act of war. And Congress would have to be alerted. And there was no alerting of anybody. Panetta did nothing. Obama did, he went to bed. I like the way, the way. Hillary didn't show up. Nobody, you know, in Hillary's talk, you know, when Hillary testified, she's like, we didn't know that this was happening and we weren't watching real time and, and, and nobody knew about it and the cables never came through. Horseshit. One of your one of your embassies is under attack. I mean, you, Graham you said to be it in best. A fucking situation room. You're in a situation room when 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 uh, Ben Laden got shot. Why weren't you in a situation room when when your damn guys were getting dragged out of damn embassies? Graham said he did. A lot, he, he took a lot of action after everybody was dead. So, I mean, he didn't take any decisive action, and that's just sickening. I mean, it's. Uh, no, he, he went out and said that it was the guy that that, that did this the movie. Uh, internet video, and and he's a you know it's a criminal thing, you know. And, and here's the bitch. That's the only person still in jail. Yeah. Him, the uh, guy that they said that, that was the antagonist. Or him, the him and George Zimmerman. <laughs> Zimmerman. And yeah. Uh, the, we, well, the guy that, that actually did something in in uh yeah he got Benghazi. Out. They captured him. And they let him go. Yeah, it's sickening. It is. And the I, only I don't one think still I... in jail is the poor bastard who, who made a, a video that wasn't that good. Now, Fast and Furious, I think they got away with Fast and Furious. I think, I mean, Eric Holder's still walking the face of the earth. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work, but I think this Benghazi thing is going to get him. I do. I think it's going to get the media, you too. Know, I, I don't want to say that because, you know, you got the media already going, oh, who cares about Benghazi? Benghazi has nothing to do with it, with Heigl being nominated for it. You know, and here's the thing. I, I kind of half wonder if Obama nominated guys that he knew just couldn't get past, and then he's going to say, well, look, see, the the Republicans are in our way again. We can't get anything done because of the Republicans. I don't know. It's possible. I, I still think, I think in the end, in the final analysis, I think uh, – one of the things that they've had going for them is they've done so many things so quickly it was too hard to focus on any one thing. Because as soon as you started focusing on one thing, Fast and Furious, something else came up, Benghazi. I mean, and I think that uh, the normal brain after a while of getting assaulted like that starts sorting things out. And I think there's so many dots to connect uh, that 
I don't know. I, I, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Now, uh, we're, you can go to the, the, the show notes links page, ladies and gentlemen, at steelcityresistance.wordpress.com. There's a couple pages uh, because there's a lot of stories we're not going to get to uh, that are good, and a lot of the ones that we did cover, there's a lot of in-depth material in there that just don't, uh, we don't have enough time to cover. So uh, send us emails at scrtv at live.com. We'll do the best we can to get them out there, even if we don't agree with them. Uh, uh, go on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash Resistance. There's a lot of good things there. You can listen to the show there. You can listen to the show on Stitcher. Uh, go to the website, steelcityresistance.wordpress.com. There's links to SCRTV on there. Uh, you can download the show on, on iTunes. Please tell your friends we're trying to, we have a, a decent audience uh, that comes back week after week, and we thank you for that. Uh, but if you know any, especially young people, we got to talk to young people, ladies and gentlemen. I have a feeling that our, I haven't really checked the demographics, but something tells me we don't need to convince you of a whole lot. But we need to get some other people on there because there's a whole lot of people out there that need convincing, and maybe we can help uh, in that effort, Ward. I don't know. I mean, it, it'd be nice to get some uh, some young people on here and asking questions and, and maybe challenging us, maybe challenging us or whatever. That's that's welcome. Yeah, we can we can set it up and do like a Google Hangout and have multiple have guests on. We'd love to do that. Yeah, let let us know if you have any ideas. That's that's a good point. If you have anything that you'd like us to to investigate or, or talk about, I'm not saying we will, but send us an email or, or uh, on Facebook. And if you'd like to participate in a Google Hangout or or something of that nature, uh, let us know. I mean, we've done it before, uh, and uh, we'd be glad to do it again. That being said, Ward, do you have anything else for the nation this week? No, sir. I am over and out. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for letting us into your life for one hour, and we will catch up with you next week.